the housing standards that we've built to date haven't been fit for purpose in terms of environmental, in terms of how people use the homes. Um, and we've seen reported about future, you know, maintenance problems in the current stock. Um, and we've never delivered enough homes through traditional supply chain and traditional delivery methods. So over the past 10 years, there's been a number of modular manufacturers coming to the fore. And we were talking just before the, the session, you know, that everybody's done small amounts of modular but nobody's really delivered at scale. So what, what, why we came together as MIG is to, to, is to improve and deliver at scale modular homes. We believe it fits with the labour policy in terms of more homes, more affordable homes, quicker delivery, but at an environmental standard that means we've got affordable heat and warmth as well. Um, as Ilka, we've delivered the first zero bills homes in the country, so there's, the residents won't pay any bills. You know, we've done it in partnership with Octopus Housing, so that Octopus will take the risk of the energy supply, our homes will guarantee the performance. So we think it's, it's incredibly important that we accelerate delivery. And I believe that, that modular should be seen as an infrastructure investment, with, you know, because it's become, become essential as part of the home's delivery for the future rather than relying on traditional home builders who will, with increasing supply chain costs, with reducing workspace, won't be able to deliver the, home, the homes for the future, but also the standards that we need. So that's the backdrop against which we're talking, Steve. I know you're going to do a little session on, on about make modular in particular, but that's, that's the backdrop to why we're here today. Great. Thanks. Can I thank Fabian, uh, great to say a few words about the work you've done previously on this? And your yes, sort of thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Now, you might be surprised I'm here because I'm not Labour's Shadow Housing Minister. That uh, role belongs to my colleague and friend, Matt Pennycook, who is exceptionally capable and I know will develop the right policies for the future of housing under a Labour government. But the reason I'm here is that seven years ago, um, I co-authored a report in my name with uh, my collaborator, Simon Jones from Leeds, about how we could bring back public social housing, how we could finance it collaboratively with, between the Treasury and uh, the pension funds, and we actually spoke to pension funds at the time, uh, and how we could use the, initially the German passive house model, which I think also morphs in very well with modular housing, because both are designed and built in factories for the site, as I understand it, anyway, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, for the site that's appropriate. So you measure the site up using the latest technologies, and then you build the housing uh, in a factory, in the dry, uh, in, in, in prefabricated sections or modular sections and it's assembled on site. It's quicker, it's much more efficient, you don't waste materials and I think most importantly your energy savings are absolutely extraordinary. So uh, it couldn't, uh, couldn't come at a more important time of course this discussion uh, as inflation, energy bills, mortgages and rent costs skyrocket under the current economic mismanagement of the so-called Conservative government. Now I think it's time that this government, or any government actually, followed the Labour Party's lead and set out how it could re-establish the link between genuinely affordable housing and average earnings, bringing affordable rents and the dream of home ownership closer for those locked out of the system today. And I can speak on behalf of two of my three adult children who currently live in London but could, are nowhere near being able to afford uh, to lay down a deposit on, on property, never mind afford the mortgages. Now, seven years ago, I co-authored a report called Building Homes for Britain, uh, and it looked into the very issues we're discussing today. And I think we're all too familiar with the ways in which poor housing exacerbates social problems such as ill health, especially amongst children, uh, as well as crime inequality and lack of social cohesion. In uh, 1996, I chaired the Education Committee of Leeds City Council, Verendra, and you, know, you were chairing housing. Um, and one of the reports I commissioned as chair of one of the largest educational authorities in the country was the link between poor quality housing and educational attainment. And guess what? There is a link. And it's a very close link. If you live in damp, cramped housing, your educational attainment as a child, both in primary and secondary, is considerably lower. And we have the empirical evidence to prove that. So we don't need to, to really uh, argue that point. It's obvious and the proof is there. But I think we have to look at ways in which an integrated approach to housing 
can deliver the volume, as you mentioned in your introductory comments, the volume and the quality of homes needed for, for the future. I think local authorities need to be given the freedom to plan and create more homes using land they have either acquired or they already own. And many local authorities, certainly outside London, still do own tracts of land. It may be contaminated, but it can be decontaminated. And I think local authorities are the best place to do this. They are large enough to project manage um, large housing developments. Um, no one else could really do that, even some of the excellent housing associations we have. Um, and I think this would also assist in reforming some of the arcane purchasing powers to stop speculators reaping all the rewards and closing the loopholes that developers use to wriggle out of affordable housing commitments. We're going to see that happening very soon with the current government. Ensuring that local councils have stronger powers to deliver the most affordable housing that their communities need, not the housing that will make the most profit for developers. Now, on the suggestion of modular housing, which is what we're here to discuss today, I think that this is a very exciting opportunity, from what little I know about it, to address some of the most pressing issues uh, of today's housing crisis, such as the skills and labour shortage. And it would be a purely factory-led process, as I understand it, as opposed to some of the traditional builds, which can be reliant on the groups of skilled tradespeople that are currently in very short supply. The cost also per square metre, uh, as I understand it, is very similar, if not less, than traditional house building. And traditional house building <coughs> often relies on the weather being good enough um, for, a, especially within a climate such as ours, um, when a significant time is often lost uh, building on site from scratch because of the weather. And this is becoming even more relevant as the climate emergency uh, gives us temperatures that are too hot to work in in the summer and, uh, as we've seen just outside today, too cold and damp to build in in autumn or winter. Modular house building takes place under one roof and usually runs day and night shifts, so production is far more efficient. But having a site-based factory means uh, measurable employment and sales go directly into the local economy, uh, which is one of the things we reported on in the uh, report that I mentioned earlier uh, that we wrote about. We can base sites where jobs are most needed and we can link the government's thoughts uh, and ideas with a local authority's industrial strategy. And whilst modular currently has limited capacity, it would be hugely beneficial, I think, for the government uh, of the day to look at this as a viable option to contribute towards, if not completely solving, the current housing crisis that's plagued our country for well over a decade, for many decades now. And I think failing to act at the moment on initiatives like Modular would be totally unforgivable. Not just on this, but also um, a windfall tax on energy firms that have made bumper profits out of our misery um, should also go into Modular housing and other forms of social housing. None of this should fall on the taxpayer's shoulders, to the taxpayer to shoulder the burden. And the government should have been working round the clock to lower people's energy bills before the current crisis hit us. But of course it hasn't. Um, so we've got this emergency plan, which who knows if it's going to work. But I think what's needed is a coordinated and comprehensive plan for housing. Um, housing is uh, absolutely vital for the stability of any society. Uh, just think that if you want to buy a mobile phone, you have to have a registered address. If you want broadband, you've got to have a base. If you're flitting from rented property to rented property, from room to room, you're not going to have that stability. We underpin the stability of our society and its future prosperity through affordable, decent housing uh, that everybody can afford. And that does not in any way interfere with the housing market where people want to buy or even the private rented sector. What it does mean is it moderates some of the rents when private rented sector uh, is way uh, under uh, providing for the demand that's actually out there. So I think what's needed is a coordinated and comprehensive plan for housing, offering innovative ways of planning, funding, uh, and building for the future. Modular can provide a lot of what is needed towards that future. Now, sadly, having the current government means that we'll be forced to see further and deeper cuts to the system and an ever freer reign for the private rent rented sectors I've already mentioned, with fewer controls on rents and other costs. And whilst this will be disastrous for so many in our society, it's clear, I think, that if we win the next election, we'll be able to develop a coherent alternative on housing that will ensure that this kind of vision can be realized under a future Labour government. And with Keir Starmer's leadership, I'm absolutely confident uh, that we can succeed in that endeavor, especially with people like Matt Pennycook, 
um, uh, steering housing policy. He's very, very good. We've got an excellent team. The solutions are out there. You've got three experts here who know considerably more than I do. But what I do know is that unless we do this, we're heading for disaster, I think. We have to provide two to 300,000 new homes in the, in, the, in the public rented sector at affordable rents that are dry, warm, cheap to heat, cheap to run, and cheap to maintain. And in that way, we can actually get everybody the homes that they need. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to build on that, I think they've been, so one of the things that we've done at uh, Big Modular, which is the newly established trade body for modular housing, is we're aware of the scale of the issues that we're facing in terms of workforce shortfall, in terms of energy bills rising, in terms of underperformance in the construction industry. Um, we're not totally sure the traditional construction industry is quite aware of how bad this is. Like it's due to lose a quarter of its workforce in the next 10 years, and that's just through retirement. So it does not, so if we just want to stand still, we need to replace that workforce in some way, and that is a difficult thing to do. So what we've done, and we'll have this coming out sort of next week, is there's a sort of first report into the delivery and state of the modular housing sector. And we've sort of really dug into what's actually being built now, what's being delivered now, and then what's the potential of that by the next general election. So this is very short to medium term. This isn't crystal ball gazing in 10 years. And I think the big things we found in this is there's enormous capacity gone in. So modular housing is a third of all R&D spending for the entire construction industry. So this is an industry that's not, the construction industry famously does not update itself particularly. It's, you know, building site looks the same as it did 25 or 100 years ago. Yes. So there's a huge investment that's gone in there. And what that's given us the capacity to do is deliver 20,000 modular homes a year by 2025, which is roughly a fifth of the shortfall in housing. And that is 20,000 homes that you don't have to go back into and refurb, or 20,000 homes that meet the net zero performance standards that Ed Miliband was talking about the other day. That's 20,000 homes that are roughly 1,500 pounds a year to heat. So and that's with project, that's with the energy bill predicted for January this year. So this is, they're greener, they're better, they're faster. Um, but added to that, they also do a really interesting thing of decoupling areas of high house prices from where jobs are created. So, you know, our colleagues in Ealing were saying about the, the tower blocks that are being built there are from a factory in Bedford. Um, you know, Dave's factory is up in uh, Yorkshire, but there are houses, modular houses on the street I live in in Bristol. So it completely decouples that. You're not reliant on creating ever more demand for fewer people in mm. the same economic areas. And then added to this as well, it's hugely more efficient. Like some traditional construction has actually got less productive in the last 20 years. Productivity levels in house building are lower now than they were in 1997 when Tony Blair came out. They've dropped. Uh, modular house building is 40% more productive in terms of the sort of floor spaces put out because you're building in factory conditions. Yeah. You know, you're building in a repeatable process, you're building with like high levels of research, development, investment in these products, and you're really able to transform the market in that space. Now, the issue for us as a sector, I think, in order to deliver this, is we need partners in local government, in government, and we have that 20,000 capacity. We're predicted to deliver about 10,000 of that by 2025. So there is, a, and the faster we can meet that capacity gap, the sooner we can then scale up even further, because actually very few of our members are currently using you know, robotics in factories. So there's a whole scale of process this could go through which will drive even greater speed, even greater quality. And the, and the other huge part of this is there's nearly a billion pounds of investment that's gone into this market. Private equity, private money that's gone in from you know, the likes of TDR, Legal in General, Goldman Sachs. Um, this won't happen again. Like this has to happen in the next few years or you know, this is a once in a generation chance to actually do something really significant about all of the issues in this country. And I think when you're talking about labor as well, you know, you guys are especially keen on building affordable housing, housing that people can actually you know, manage to live in. Modular works really well for rental because you build it faster. It's 50% faster to build. You're not holding over on absorption rates. You can put this out and take people off your waiting lists within weeks. And the last one is I think a lot of you are looking at regeneration schemes within mm -hmm. local authorities and local areas. Well, one of the big sticking points with regeneration is, you know, is decanting people when yeah. you're changing stuff and that people don't know what their home they have is going to be replaced with. You can literally take people to see these homes in a factory. You can see 
or on a different site because it will be the same type of house. So they can see firsthand what's going on, talk to people who are in those properties and really understand like what it will be like to live there. So there's a huge variation of benefits for this. But what we really, really need is all of government to get behind this. And the good thing is, as it's at the scale it's at the moment, this doesn't need to be national government. This can be labor-led local yeah. authorities. This can be labor-led you know, metro mayors. It can be regional government. That There is enough scale and enough delivery potential there for actually labor to take ownership of this and be the leaders in this by 2025. Um, so that would be my five-minute summary for you all, uh, and then we'll sure we can take some questions. And I know Steve Tracy Braben, the Mayor of West Yorkshire, the Labour Mayor of West Yorkshire, is actually looking at just that uh -huh. for the West Yorkshire area. Yeah. Um, I'm really sorry that I've got to go, but yeah. I'd love to come and visit your factory. Absolutely. Where about, isn't it? There's on the A1, oh, yeah. Jun Fantastic. Junction exactly 5047. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll follow it up. If so. I could just say one thing. Yeah. Um, so I served as, on, as chair for my local um, Labour housing group. And one thing we desperately need is good quality homes. Um, growing up, I went through periods where I was homeless and lived in social housing. And we lived in really recent social housing. The quality was so poor. Now we've managed to get to a point in our lives where we live in a house that we own, and it's a 1920s council house, and the quality is unbelievably yes. different. I think under a Tory government, we've really gone to a place where we have really lowered the quality of homes, and I think with um, making modular homes, we can really hopefully increase that quality back to making homes that are fit for families. And I think that's something that we really need to work towards. Mm -hmm. And on your point about metro mayors, so, you know, I work with Dan Norris, the mm -hmm. Mess of England Metro Mayor, who is very good at the building of the house. I think he's very good at the house. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sure, we'll see you. Thanks, David. I'll follow up with an invite. Thanks for your comments. Really. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Steve, can I, can I just make a couple of comments on the point of quality? Because I found that, that, um, that point extremely um, powerful and actually in many respects uh, illustrates kind of the reason why Make UK as the umbrella trade association for manufacturing has, has really got behind this issue. Uh, quality, I think, is, is really key. And I think what we are excited about, and I speak to someone whose mum was born in 1945, uh, she was born in Bristol because that's where my grandfather was sent uh, at the end of the war because of the nature of his injuries. He needed to be near the French A Hospital in Bristol and she lived in very poor quality housing when she was born. And in 1949, she moved to a brand new high quality Homes Fit for Heroes house and it transformed her life. And I think wherever we look, the thing that Modular has really been incredibly good at and is incredibly powerful at is about bringing the best elements of manufacturing technology and capability and quality to apply them to the construction of houses. And I think what's really important that we take away from here, if you're not familiar with modular housing, is that what we're talking about are fantastically high quality products. Products that, as people have said, can have an incredibly powerful impact on the cost of running your home, of heating your home, because they're produced to the highest standards of uh, environmental uh, measurement produced to a position where the emissions from these houses are tiny, where the insulation of these properties are absolutely second to none. And we represent many manufacturing industries, but so I think points that many of the speakers have already made really hits home. We're making houses in broadly speaking the way in which a carpenter or a bricklayer from a hundred years ago would find incredibly comfortable. They'd walk onto a building site and some of the tools might be different, but fundamentally it's the same process. I was born at the start of the 1970s and I can remember how many times my dad's car used to break down as we attempted to visit relatives and travel around the country. The kind of quality that you had in those sort of products at that point was such that we just assumed that everyone needed to be able to fix their own car and be able to get underneath it and, and get it to run again. And now we have cars that put bluntly, you service every year and you forget about them, you don't even check the oil because the quality of manufacturing, the quality of engineering is such that we've designed out all of those faults. And what I think, if you're not familiar with, with modular housing, the way in which I think it's worth getting your head around it is that what we can do is take those lessons of engineering and manufacturing where we've driven up the quality of so many products, where we have high quality, reliable products that are produced at competitive prices, that are future proof, 
that's what modular housing is doing to the to the construction industry. That's what modular modular housing is doing to the quality of the homes that people can live in. So whether you're from a local authority, whether you're from a developer, I think the technology has now matured. The technology is now at the very top end of reliability, of capability. And what we're doing here is offering you that fantastic ability to get a value for money product, but a product that is at the quality end of the market, which provides those people, whether they're private buyers, uh, whether they are social housing tenants, with a home that they can be proud to live in. And I think that's one of the things that we really hope people can take away from, from today's conversation and the conversation we hope to be having over the months to come. Sorry, I was just gonna add, I mean, it is, we're now in, sort of in a position where many of the London boroughs are pulling out, many of our generation is being stolen mm. because they're not just viable with current costs of normal house building asking to come to a halt. You literally can't build them at a price where you know it costs you more to build a home than you could actually sell it for in the market. It's that bad. Mm. And the reality is we need to find some other way of construction which delivers us the value we need. And it, it is it, it's absolutely, I can't believe it. most of our schemes are coming to a halt. And some of the DRA and all the rest of it will see the issues coming through. It would be that currently we can't afford to build in the current way. So we do need, but we do need, I suppose, our planning system to change, to match, because I suppose you can make them in different shapes and all the rest of it, but there is a, an issue around square boxes and all the rest of it and how you actually create buildings which are in planning terms also fit in with the, the environment and where you are but your quality is really important and passive homes if you can get that through because we want to be greener and we want to be it deliver passive homes but those inflate your costs even more and so therefore it's already unaffordable and we're now finding a having to choose between having a greener homes or being able to afford a point where you can actually build it. And, but they're still, as many of the regeneration schemes are still open. So we do have an opportunity if you can bring forward a different solution to us. I mean, I think that's one of those things we're wrestling with. One of the reasons why we've set up Make Modular, but within Make UK is that, that this, is a, this is an issue with many, many challenges around it. Um, uh, that fit across a number of government departments, fit across um, regional government and local government as well as national government. And I think from our perspective, I think the, the big call to arms for, for us is actually the financial benefits and the cost savings that we can engineer will come out of the economies of scale. And I think if, as well as planning, if we can get government to think about the way in which they um, classify modular, the way in which they set targets for modular and the way in which they support local government financially, then actually those benefits could come to the ball very quickly and could drive down the costs of, of those regeneration schemes. I've, I've worked a little bit in regeneration. I know exactly the problems that you've talked about. And I think what we're saying is this is one of those things where I think if we get this right, we can start to bring about a positive effect around the country. Uh, we have got quality products that aren't square boxes. We can, we can deal with the planning issues. We've got quality products that produce really energy efficient homes and, and that is hugely important. And I think what we're saying to, to government is if you can work with local government on the funding, if you can work with local government on the targets, uh, this can have a transformational effect at, at really quite high speed. James? Yeah, I just wanted to make a point. I kind of asked a question, you probably started to touch on it there, but just, you know, whatever those that's around the table might think about the volume housing builders, they, you know, they, they're business model is predicated on returning investments to their shareholders, you know, not to solve the housing crisis. So they will always do the thing that's most beneficial to them, um, and why would they, I guess. So what, how do we get to that tipping point where those volume house builders in particular stop building homes in the way you've described, you know, in ways that our, grand, you know, our grandparents would, would, uh, would be familiar with? Like what's, what point, how do we get to that tipping point? They won't change their model until we break the model. 
and that's where we become more cost effective than traditional build which is two three years away yeah. then they will have to re respond to the market it's also interesting on viability challenges that if people can no longer afford to buy the home they'll need to reinvent themselves and, and I mean fundamentally having worked in this I mean I've been through three housing market recessions um, and they always readjust but they, they can't resist going back to their old practices which is shareholder returns and we need more strategic partnerships with local government to create a model where we can reinvest some of that wealth back through the cycle because you always have the viability <coughs> challenge while we have the housing market designed the way it is until we pull the handbrake nothing's going to change well, well all i would add to that is i think it's very interesting having come into this world you know dave understands this world incredibly well and, and uh uh, and it's been fascinating to work with with Dave to, to to learn some of that. But what I think is interesting is coming in is seeing how many of those traditional firms are starting to develop volumetric modular yeah. products. And I think if you wanted an indication of what the future trend is going to be, it is that you know after some false dawns and and so on, if you look around, those firms are now seeing that this is where the future is. And I think Dave's point is where can you get to the tipping point where you move across to that uh, faster and, and, and more effectively. Absolutely. But I don't think there's any doubt about what the next 20 years looks like. Mm. It's whether or not, for, for, in a crass phrase, we see the future tomorrow or we see the future in 10 years' time. So you were... I was going to say, I think one more question you haven't touched on. The challenge we have in the UK is the price of land. So I'm very familiar with Clayton Homes in North America, because I'm shareholder of Clayton Hathaway, so I go to that shareholder meeting. And basically, it's a bit like designing a kitchen. You go and sit in the, in the uh, sales cabin, you design your house, you buy your land, and then you deliver it precision manufactured. Because that's another thing that needs to be mentioned, is precision manufactured. to have very, very tight tolerances, so there's not going to be gaps, it's not going to fall apart. And I think, so, and, and I think, there are also, there are developers in the UK already using it, not necessarily for whole developments, but having like bathrooms built off site and then craned in to save and get plumbers crawling around their hands and knees. So, and there's some, some uh, former town hall redevelopments in hotels, they've had bathrooms just craned in, basically, all in one. So, you, you, your plumbers do it on an assembly line, they come down on the back of a lorry overnight down the M1 and get claimed in, so you don't actually have to have people working in tight areas. Indeed. Yeah, we, we, we've used the pods. We actually visited Clayton Homes when we were sent our factory up to understand yeah. uh, their dynamic. And their single family homes is on a different type platform to what we use. Mm. But we were learning from their engineering. The land market in the UK does need an assessment and a readjustment. And part of the problem is, is the the disconnect between where people want to live and necessarily where people need to live. There's, there's a disconnect between them two, which drives an, an, an inflation that just, it needs a more strategic thinking by government about how land comes to the market. And until we build more affordable homes, this, this, this challenge will always exist. And that's a policy decision that the government needs to take. So if, but you know, Clayton Homes also provide a mortgage as well. Yeah. Which is, because it's, it's a very, very competitive value product they deliver. It's a slightly different market, a yes. slightly different model, but, but we, had, we, had, we did go and we visited Japan and we also visited Germany around how we set the factory up as well, so taking some of the learning. But until this government, I mean, you talk, we talked about the Holland model, mm. until we learn from Europe around how to bring more affordable homes back through so we can take the land value through the asset rather than just as a capital gain, we're always going to struggle. I think also, James, just to come on the point you're making about like where the volume guys have gone in the last so, 20 years, they just hammered, if you think of cost, quality, and time for delivery, they've just hammered cost. And now you can't, A, you, you're getting diminishing returns out of that, and B, the market fundamentals have changed so much with, you know, sterling <laughs> and labour force and construction materials that you can't beat that drum anymore. So you have to go into those other two elements. Yeah. Which are massively, that's the R&D spin. That's why it's massively underutilized, is it's in that space as well. But I was a chief executive of a volume house builder, so I, I understand the dynamics. <laughs>
Yeah. Yes. Uh, first, an apology because this is not my first choice meeting, which is oversubscribed. Um, but it so happens it's subject I've been involved in all my adult life. Um, I've uh, first worked for the local authority in 1961, and uh, in the 60s, uh, when I later uh, became a, a councillor and so forth, uh, in a small local authority in the North East, we were building 300 council houses a year by traditional methods. Uh, later, government came in, and all the, I'm, I'm completely persuaded by your arguments, but I've heard them all before, yeah. only 50, 60 years ago, when government said to us as a local authority, if you want to build council houses, you've got to use system building. Must use system building. And I'm bound to say that um, all the estates that were built in my authority, the four estates built, have all been demolished. All of them. The ex-council house in which I live, built over 50, 60 years ago, is still standing strong, nothing wrong with it. And when I first accounted that, an estate of prefabs built after the war. And authorities wanted to come and knock them down because by then they were 20 years old, only built for 10 years. The people resisted because they were such lovely homes. As far as the tenants are concerned, nothing wrong with them. So, um, just one more point. You mentioned about um, local uh, factory, manufacturing, manufacture the units. I went to the one in the northeast, in Gerald. It was quite obvious, because I was then working for uh, uh, a, a local contractor building these things, um, why they wouldn't fit. Because the standards of, cons of uh, manufacture by people who didn't know what they were doing, lack of supervision, and they were just not right. The, um, I was supported in this by the chief architect of uh, Newcastle City Council, who went to the one in Scotland, and he was horrified at what he saw. So really, I'm, I'm totally persuaded by what, what you want to do. And I, I recall um, seeing films in the 50s and 60s in America, where they did exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing as you say, building the units or building the whole house, dropping them in. But how can you avoid the mistakes of the past? That's really what I'm after. And that was very important when we set the factory up. So what we ensured was it wasn't a manufacturer building houses or a house builder trying to manufacture. We brought the two together. So we brought expertise in from manufacturing, but also house builders. The other difference is everyone has to have a warranty from NHBC now, which is the the prefabs of the past didn't. Mm. So we, we've now got external verification on the quality systems and processes. And when we created the factories, they have to stand up to the same test as traditional. And you know some of the quality issues that, that we've made reference to. So we did look backwards to look forwards. I mean, I, I, I built some houses in 1980 in Hull for Wimpy's out of North Fines. I knocked the same houses down in 2004. Same because, thing. Because yep. we're poor. No fines. No yep. fines. No Wor worst thing you could build in. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but, but, but we have looked backwards to make sure that we put the quality systems in, we learn the lessons of the past, and that we make sure that the homes we build, I mean, our homes have got a 100-year guarantee, which is the same as traditional, um, and we're using materials now which are common to the construction industry rather than some of the part cabins and the prefabs that we build out of strammer board and out of you know, so, so we, we, these are different problems. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'll, I'll just add a, a small add 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 yeah, point please. about finance because um, uh, when uh, Thatcher uh, made a sell of that, not only did we have to sell them at a large discount, uh, so any tenant who didn't buy the house was, was silly. <laughs> um, the, we were not allowed to keep uh, the all money, so the really yeah. we couldn't reinvest. And, and as we know, council housing, uh, or social housing, whatever you like to call it, affordable housing, came to a virtual halt. And uh, um, a hope that a future Labour government would enable local authorities to go back to their traditional role of being housing authorities 
so instead of having that hived off, uh, I just I, I thought it, the, the council house people love the council houses. They looked after them. They tended the gardens. You know, they, 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 this is our house for life until maybe move into an old people's bungalow. But it worked, and the traditional building. I agree with you about following standards, but it's partly because um, firms have found uh, a reduced supervisory staff, so that there isn't the supervision. Also, there's a huge amount of, um, uh, of, of hiving off these things to, to contractors, subcontractors, sub subcontractors mm -hmm. who can uh, have lump labour, you know, all those things. Uh, it's a very good point. If I'm you can still... keep it under control by building these things in your, in your own uh, factory premises or whatever, to keep up those standards, yes, I'm with you. As I say, I'm, I'm sold on this. I'm sorry to say my present authority is not a housing authority, so I can't <laughs> <help>. <laughs> Well, when they are a housing authority. Thank you. Good. Thank, thank you for that. And uh, thanks, all of you. I'm, I'm aware of time. I've run a little over, but thanks everyone for, for that. That was, was very useful and, and glad to have that conversation. Really interesting to hear from all of you. Um, do keep an eye out for what we're doing. Please feel free to get in touch if there's anything uh, of use we can do on that front. And thanks to SME for Labour for hosting that. Thank, thank you. you.